So we wanted to talk for a bit this morning about uh, circadian rhythm sleep disorders. I think you'll find this uh, interesting. And uh, at the end of the talk, we'll have a little quiz. Don't worry, it's informal. Uh, and you can test yourself on a few things and what you picked up during the presentation. Um, but it is an interesting topic, and, uh, and it affects a lot of people, really, because there's so many different types. And some can be transient. Some can just affect us during parts of our lives. Some can be lifelong patterns. It, it just depends, but very interesting topic. Uh, I have nothing to disclose, no uh, uh, industry affiliation or anything. So what does circadian mean? So it's Latin for around a day, okay? And this is our pattern or rhythm of physiology and behaviors that varies around the 24-hour uh, cycle. And, uh, and it relies upon uh, different inputs. So there's both an endogenous or within us component and exogenous components. And you'll see how that plays into some of the disorders later. Uh, but it turns out our actual natural circadian rhythm is just a little bit longer than 24 hours. Uh, so we need that outside external input in order to help keep that uh, regulated. Okay, and it provides this 24 hour around the day rhythm uh, to many different factors, including uh, our sleep wake cycle, our core body temperature, uh, various endocrine functions with hormone releases and when those occur, uh, feeding behaviors, all of those kinds of things. Um, and uh, in terms of the things that can affect that, the two primary things uh, are light and melatonin, and we'll talk a little bit more about those uh, here on this slide. The origination of our circadian rhythm is a nucleus in the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, okay? And that's located in the anterior hypothalamus uh, adjacent to the optic chiasm, a part of our uh, visual tract, okay? And you'll see how that plays in, 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 in a bit as we talk more about the different disorders. But these zeitgebers or time givers, okay, that's a German word for time givers, uh, play in directly to that. So there's, we're hardwired to respond to light. There's a direct track from the retina to the hypothalamus, okay, where this nucleus is located. Uh, that gives us input as to whether or not we should be awake or asleep. So in a natural environment without external lighting, uh, the, uh, uh, it, it, it has a tremendous effect because you get that direct feed in, okay? Uh, turns out um, before artificial lighting was introduced, uh, individuals slept uh, more. The average person slept more like nine to ten hours. And then after we started manipulating the environment and introducing light, that number really drove down to seven, eight hours. So its effect can be quite dramatic. And then the other thing uh, that primarily affects it uh, exogenously is melatonin. Excuse me, I said endogenously. The light is endogenous, the melatonin. Excuse me, the light is ex. Those words are too similar. We need to change those words. Light is exogenous or outside, melatonin or inside. Um, and that's secreted by the pineal gland. That's also a structure in the brain located more uh, posteriorly. And it, melatonin's release is suppressed by bright light. Okay, and that plays into how we manipulate things with uh, light therapy. Uh, usually our melatonin level rises approximately two hours before uh, sleep onset. And there is this direct uh, feedback loop with the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So general characteristics about disorders are uh, usually it presents as either insomnia or hypersomnia uh, or both, kind of depending upon when you catch it, 
okay, or what phase you're in with how out of sync you are. So it's not uncommon for individuals to have complaints. Um, is this cutting out just a little bit? Did that sounded like it dropped out for a second there? Um, and these individuals oftentimes self-medicate, uh, so they're at risk for substance. Uh, and alcohol abuse, and the reason why is they're trying to uh, adapt, okay? So they're using uh, different substances to help them stay awake or to help them go to sleep, things like that. A lot of people are under the misconception that uh, alcohol helps them sleep. Well, it can facilitate sleep onset, uh, but the net result of alcohol is to actually interrupt sleep, lead to far more nighttime awakenings and overall less sleep. So um, it's very common for individuals to, to use these substances in order to try and uh, adjust to their disorder. There are things you can use to try and identify these different disorders, including the morningness, eveningness questionnaire. Uh, and often, actigraphy is quite helpful for diagnosis. How many are familiar at all with actigraphy? and have looked at, so not many, okay, so that's good. We'll see at the end um, several examples and, uh, and that'll illustrate quite a few things, I think. Uh, we'll look at delayed sleep phase, advanced sleep phase, shift work, free running type circadian rhythm disorder, irregular sleep-wake, jet lag, and then there are also some circadian rhythm disorders that are really secondary to other medical disorders, okay? The first one, and definitely one of the most common that you'll encounter is delayed sleep phase. Okay? Uh, and it's very, very common in younger individuals, teenagers. Uh, you know, teenagers kind of get a, a bad rap about being lazy when they tend to want to stay up late and, uh, and then sleep late in the morning. Uh, but it, it actually for a lot of them, as many as five to 16% in different studies looking at a, a prevalence, uh, you, can, uh, you can see that it's actually due to these physiologic changes leading them to favor that delayed sleep phase time. Uh, you know, so definitely these are your night owls. And it, it, usually it's a delay of at least two hours uh, so it puts them out of sync with the rest of the world. Um, just because somebody prefers a slightly later bedtime doesn't mean necessarily that it's a disorder. Uh, it's only if it causes an issue. So in other words, it's very difficult to get them awake and off to school in the mornings or uh, people can't function in the morning at work uh, without being terribly impacted, those kind of things. Uh, it can tend to run in families, so it's not at all uncommon if somebody has this to have a family history of delayed sleep phase. And the, uh, sleep is often normal after it's initiated. Um, so when it's uninterrupted and unrestricted, then generally they don't have complaints. So your classic example of that uh, is the teenager who struggles during the year and they, and you know, mom or dad will, they have insomnia at night and then they're sleepy during the day, uh, especially the first half of the day. Uh, and that's because they're attending school during the time that their body's telling them that they should be asleep. And of course, they've gone to bed later, so they've missed sleep. Um, and certainly now, this is only more and more common because so many kids take their cell phones to bed and then get light input, and they might tell uh, a little bit of an exaggeration about what time they turn it off, so instead of actually turning it off, at a reasonable time, they're actually lying there in bed looking at it till midnight, one o'clock later. Um, and, and they tell themselves, you know, of course, well, that's not abnormal because I'm awake anyway. You know, I'm looking at it. But they don't realize we are hardwired to respond to that light. To, to, so it tends to make us stay awake. Um, so that definitely can be uh, uh, an increasing problem for all of us, really, because the cell phone usage only tends to uh, increase year to year, it seems. Um, typically, these individuals go to bed somewhere between 2 to 6 a.m. Um, 
Their preferred wake time is anywhere from 10 to 1. It can be later. Uh, it's not uncommon to see individuals who are waking up at 2 or even 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Extreme cases even outside of that, possibly. Uh, they're very difficult to wake up uh, in the morning, so really hard to get them off to school or get ready to go to school um, or to work. I keep talking about young people. Just That's the situation where you see it the most. Older individuals tend to try to just adapt and soldier through, so usually it's the younger individuals that are brought to attention. But this certainly can affect uh, young adults as well after they transition into the workplace. Um, another common complaint is uh, insomnia only on the weekdays. And it's because on the weekends, they uh, shift to their preferred schedule. So Friday night, they stay up till 3 o'clock, and Saturday they uh, sleep till noon. Uh, so, you know, therefore, it's not an issue for them. You know, they're, they're, they're not complaining of insomnia those nights. Uh, there's uh, a lot of uh, daytime sleepiness, obviously, that's an issue related to that. Um, if you truncate that end sleep, you can imagine, uh, like if you go to bed at a traditional time, if someone came in and woke you up every night at 2 a.m. and said, oh, Uh, so, this can definitely impact individuals significantly, work performance, academic performance, um, all those kind of, uh, kinds of issues. And oftentimes, these are individuals who use a lot of caffeine in order to compensate. Okay? Some of the treatments that you can use um, are uh, melatonin. Uh, anywhere from, there's a fairly wide variance in terms of recommended dosages, including uh, anywhere from 0 0.5 or a half milligram up to 5 milligrams. Uh, some individuals use more. And usually that's taken about 7 to 9 p.m. Um, and I always tell people the timing is really, really important with melatonin because it's not that, melatonin's not like many of the others where you're just trying to take it and then fall asleep, hopefully you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes later, something like that. There's a phase response curve to melatonin. So when individuals actually respond to that in terms of advancing their sleep phase, that peak is right around 8 o'clock to 8.30, something like that. That's usually my recommended time. And I always, you have to tell them, you know, look, it's not that I want you to go to bed at 8.30. <laughs> you take it at 8 to 8.30 so that hopefully you can fall asleep more like 10, 10.30, 11 o'clock, like that. Because you see this dramatic drop off in that phase response curve where if they take it, you know, at, uh, past 9 o'clock, even at 9 o'clock, you really have dropped down on that uh, responsiveness. Uh, but past that, you know, the, the effect is really, really diminished. So if you're letting them take it at 10.30, 11 o'clock to try and fall asleep around the time, you really kind of miss the boat. There's, uh, there's not going to be nearly as much phase advance with that. Night exposure can be important. Uh, so, you know, again, because of that direct input, you want to avoid major light uh, right before that. And it turns out, yes, light, computer screen, or a smartphone screen is enough to trigger that, that, that the brain misinterprets that as, oh, it's daytime, you should be awake. Okay, so it really does turn on the wake neurons and uh, turn off the sleep neurons, so it really sends that signal that you should be asleep. Having a very regular, uh, set, stable sleep schedule can be incredibly helpful, okay? So not shifting on the weekends dramatically, trying to keep that generally within um, ideally an hour or so of your weekday uh, sleep schedule is fantastic if you can do that, you know, maybe an hour and a half, something like that, just because those shifts are really difficult. Um, I know, uh, for example, my wife, she's a school teacher, and the first day back after a break, 
is really tough. She knows to not present any major material on those first days because you know she's seeing all these kids doing this. It's because they've reverted to their preferred delayed sleep phase schedule and then they're coming in with only a few hours sleep that first, uh, first day back or so. So it can take a little while. Um, chronotherapy you'll see listed as a therapeutic option for um, delayed sleep phase. I'm not a huge fan of that just because uh, in my opinion it doesn't work well. Um, it can. It's where you get individuals to progressively delay uh, their, their bedtime by, and you may say, well, why would you delay it if they're already delayed? What you're trying to do is progressively delay it three hours later every few days to get them to where they fall asleep more at a traditional time, okay? Because, and that's the other thing is, it's obviously much easier to have them delay it than to advance it. You can't just say, well, let's fix it by, we'll put you in bed at 10 o'clock and you'll go to sleep. You know, that, that doesn't work, but those delays can help. The only thing is it's kind of a runaway caboose, right? So after you've progressively delayed, then what happens then? They don't stay in that pattern. They tend to delay again, so they get out of sync. So it's just not a very helpful uh, therapeutic option. It's just something to be aware of. Um, I just don't see that really working, uh, especially uh, more on a long-term basis. Uh, this can improve uh, or resolve in uh, early adulthood just on its own. Um, so a lot of people you know, who are like that as teenagers or adolescents uh, can start to function much more normally in the workplace environment. But that's not always the case, certainly. Um, so for some individuals, it can be uh, a much uh, more protracted uh, issue. The flip side of this is advanced sleep phase. Um, this is less common. Uh, you see it in a, approximately 1% of middle-aged or older individuals. And that's where their uh, typical sleep time and wake times are out of sync uh, in a different direction. They go to bed far too early and, and wake up far too early. Uh, to be in sync with the rest of their family. And again, this is for a lot of these individuals, uh, they prefer it. So if they prefer it, it's not impacting their life, then it's not a sleep disorder, okay? So you know, if they like to go to bed at 7 o'clock and get up at 3, um, and it doesn't impact things, then you know, there's no need to address it. Uh, but if they say, you know, gosh, I'm missing out on my family's uh, evening activities, I'm out of sync, you know, or my family eats at seven o'clock and I'm ready to go to bed and um, you know th those kind of situations that's where you you know would want to address it we don't really know what causes this uh, per se uh, but it can be familial uh, and their typical time of sleep onset is somewhere between 6 to 9 p.m. and then they wake somewhere between 2 to 5 okay uh, as I mentioned some cases are familial um, but much like delayed sleep phase, the sleep quality and duration are otherwise normal, okay, for their age. And one important distinction to make is to uh, differentiate this from depression. Depression commonly causes early morning awakenings. So, and probably many individuals have experienced this where there's something that's in particular bearing on your mind and all of a sudden at uh, 3 a.m. it's just your eyes fly wide open. And of course, that first thought is whatever that concern or stressor may be. Uh, so that can be a, a sign of depression. The uh, one way to help differentiate between the two is the sleep onset is not like an advanced sleep phase. So, you know, they don't go to bed necessarily at 6 a.m. Of course, depression could be its own whole separate talk because those individuals may go to bed, but they may sit there and ruminate and worry and things like that. So that's different, you know, obviously. Uh, or they may stay in bed for, throughout much of the day, you know, or they may stay up and almost never go to bed. So, you know, a lot of different things that can play in there. But advanced sleep phase uh, does tend to be lifelong after it starts. Some of the therapy that you can do for um, phase 
is light therapy uh, beginning around 7 to 8 p.m., whereas um, for uh, delayed sleep phase, you know, you do the, uh, the morning light therapy, uh, usually in that same range, two to 5,000 lux. Uh, this one, the recommendation is 4,000 lux for about two hours in the evening, usually between seven to eight. Um, morning melatonin can delay the circadian clock. Uh, so it may sound really bizarre. You take it, and obviously you don't try to go to sleep like you would if you were a, a shift work um, sleep disorder individual. Uh, but it can really help in terms of uh, delaying that uh, timing in the evenings for advanced sleep phase. Um, <clears throat> chronotherapy is also an option for advanced sleep phase. Uh, and they, you know, again, uh, kind of opposite of what you might initially think. They try and advance progressively. But again, same thing. You may advance to where they get to that point, but then past that, there's nothing to stop it. Darkened bedroom for sunrise can be quite helpful for these individuals. And also increased daytime activity level can be very helpful. Here's something that... Most of us know something about in this room, uh, shift work type uh, sleep disorder. Um, <clears throat> and this is where you experience either insomnia or excessive daytime sleepiness resulting from shift work uh, occurring during your typical sleep time, okay? Or what your physiology is telling you uh, in terms of when you should be asleep. Uh, actually about 15 to 30% of the workforce is engaged in shift work. So uh, it's much higher than you might think otherwise. Uh, but so it's a very common uh, issue. Rotating shifts are the most difficult. Uh, it's easier for individuals to either be on second shift or third shift than it is for them to work a week on first shift, week on second shift, week on third shift and then maybe have a week off and then go back through the cycle. <clears throat> that's extremely difficult. Uh, and that's, without question, the least favorable uh, of the options in terms of uh, uh, work schedules. Uh, oftentimes, individuals who have shift work disorder have decreased productivity. Uh, their brain's telling them they should be asleep, so that's not a situation where you're going to be your most productive. Uh, there's more irritability, other cognitive difficulties, difficulties with attention and concentration, which of course can lead to illness, um, fatigue issues, uh, negative interactions with coworkers, you know, all those kinds of things. So shift work sleep disorder, their free time is consumed by uh, trying to make up those uh, lost sleep hours. And a lot of these individuals <clears throat> also try and do that uh, uh, same kind of shift on off days where, no, I want to be in sync with the rest of my family on off days. So, you know, then I switch automatically to trying to sleep at night. So that can be very difficult. Some individuals it's much easier than others, but uh, it can be quite a challenge. So the more you can minimize that uh, adjustment or, or shift, the better in terms of uh, impacting the, the, how it impacts you with insomnia or daytime sleepiness. There's been some literature recently uh, to suggest that it may increase the risk for other conditions, including breast cancer and uh, heart disease. So definitely, you know, there's more research going into that and uh, in, in, in exactly how that happens or what else it may uh, impact. Some therapy options are uh, bright light therapy. So 5,000 to 10,000 lux during the first half of the night shift. Does it have to be continuous? Obviously, that's difficult to do. It can be uh, intermittent, uh, but that can really help you stay awake during the uh, work shift. Um, and obviously, you have to be very cautious about that uh, morning commute 
when you're driving back home so you can make sure you uh, address it to avoid any kind of issues with uh, motor vehicle accidents. Morning melatonin of 2 to 5 milligrams when you lie down in bed can help. Uh, also, you know, potentially other uh, sleep medications or soporifics. For some individuals, they require stimulants to get through the work shift, including uh, armodafinil, modafinil. Uh, a lot of individuals use caffeine in order to uh, impact this. Uh, trying to make sure you have a dark bedroom environment, again, because of that light input, that direct light input that can so significantly impact that. Um, sleep hygiene, by that, uh, you know, just meaning, of course, trying to not do a lot of uh, very active things immediately before you try to go to sleep. You know, doing everything you can in order to facilitate sleep onset when you're trying. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, kind of regularizing that sleep schedule, not doing those constant shifts because um, it's almost as though you're kind of working a rotating shift of, of sorts if you're switching between days off and, and work days. <clears throat> now we'll talk for a second about some of the less common uh, circadian rhythm disorders, including uh, non-24 hour sleep-wake disorder. Uh, this used to also be called free running type. And that's where <clears throat> these individuals are reverting to the natural physiology that a lot of, that all of us have really, where that normal 24 hour uh, circadian rhythm is actually, you know, 24 point, um, 2.3 hours. So you can see, so you just are slightly off. And oftentimes you see this in individuals who are blind. Uh, and it's because they don't get that light input, that time giver, Zeitgeber, to help keep that in that normal 24 hour cycle. Um, <clears throat> you can also see it with different brain tumors, oftentimes located uh, where it can press on the optic chiasm and also lead to, obviously, blindness and, and impaired uh, light input. Um, about 40% of blind individuals have this type of sleep disorder. So that tells you really, you know, we're really, and, and probably a lot of the ones who don't have it have even more cues, you know, to help keep them in their normal 24-hour uh, uh, cycle. Um, usually, uh, these individuals are, it's kind of like they're doing their own uh, chronotherapy, except it's not therapeutic, obviously, but they're progressively delaying by about one hour on a daily basis. So you can see they're just, you know, each day their sleep shifts back further and further and further. So depending upon where you catch it on that cycle, uh, as you can imagine, if that eight-hour, uh, traditional eight-hour sleep schedule shifts continuously, then there will be times where they sleep their eight hours during the day, and then they're awake all night, right? So it depends on when you catch it. Uh, they may say, well, there, there are times I sleep all day. Uh, there are times where I sleep all night and have no issues. And it just depends on where you catch it because, you know, even though you may get to that point where you're sleeping during the day, you're going to continue to delay uh, until you get back into a regular schedule again. And then you're going to keep going. So uh, it can be a major issue, you know, obviously. Um, there are some very effective treatments for this. I've had incredible success for several individuals with a melatonin receptor agonist called Tazamelteon. Uh, melatonin can also be used, but uh, it's definitely been my experience to active uh, binds to the melatonin receptor, um, <coughs> excuse me, receptors, and uh, activates those. So uh, it can be really life-altering for these individuals. Um, even though some individuals may be blind, some can still respond to light. They may not see light, uh, but 
uh, there are components of that retinal hypothalamic tract that could still be intact, so they may still get the signals, okay? So they might not see, but they can still get that input. So making sure they have normal lighting, doing things like uh, being exposed to bright light immediately before bed. Uh, different social activities, exercise, uh, all that can be quite uh, helpful, okay? Making sure all that takes place at normal times, uh, staying more active during the day, and uh, just other time cues as you can introduce those. Uh, can really Uh, there's another interesting type called irregular sleep-wake type circadian rhythm disorder. And this is where there's really no identifiable circadian rhythm, okay? Uh, no clear pattern whatsoever throughout the 24-hour cycle. Um, little is known about the pathophysiology or course, but you can see it in individuals with uh, significant cognitive challenges, so uh, uh, in cases of neurodevelopmental delay uh, in children, um, in older individuals, sometimes with dementia, as that advances, uh, that can cause a lot of issues with an irregular sleep-wake schedule. Um, uh, structural lesions uh, and other psychiatric conditions that are quite severe, but usually at the core of the problem is some sort of severe brain dysfunction that leads to a complete loss of that uh, sleep-wake rhythm. Um, and again, it, this can be completely random in terms of whether or not they may uh, experience uh, daytime sleepiness or insomnia as perceived by others primarily, uh, just depending upon whether or not they happen to be asleep or awake, which occurs in the most affected individuals. Uh, oftentimes their sleep is quite broken up, so they may just nap frequently throughout the day, that sort of thing. And of course, that impacts sleep drive and so forth. Um, so, you know, what you want to try and do is avoid those kinds of situations. In the hospitals, we're finding, we're kind of introducing some of this in a lot of individuals because uh, you didn't think about it, but, you know, if someone was in the ICU or an institution where there were workers around, all working different shifts, then the bright lights would be on all the time. And in the past, we didn't think about it, and then, you know, there came to be more attention uh, paid to this issue, so it's like, oh, okay, you know what, in these ICUs at night, we really need to turn the lights down, because these individuals are trying to sleep, you know, so... And, and they started trying to put more windows in ICU rooms and so that, you know, they could have that natural light input as cues. And not to mention it helps with other things like mood and just orientation and things like that. So those kind of issues can be uh, quite dramatic. Uh, actigraphy can be very helpful for diagnosis. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about actigraphy in a second. Um, melatonin in children can help. It depends on how severely affected the individual is. Sometimes it ha does not have a dramatic impact. Um, regularizing the sleep schedule, increasing daytime activity, light exposure, a lot of the same kind of common themes that you see in terms of giving people input as to when they should be asleep and when they should be awake. Uh, but typically, hypnotics are not helpful in this uh, case. Jet lag type. I'm sure most individuals have experienced this. Um, it's very common. Uh, usually it's not so dramatic that it's brought to medical attention. Usually you just kind of have to struggle through for a couple days when you uh, have significant travel. Uh, and I always say, you know, just if you cross from Eastern time zone into Central, it doesn't mean automatically you have jet lag type sleep disorder. Usually you have to cross multiple time zones in order to have that impact. Uh, westward travel is easier for most individuals. For most of us, it's easier to delay than it is to advance. Um, if you think about it, that, you know, most of us have been like that. Think about when you're a kid and somebody says, no, it's time to go to bed and go to sleep. 
now that's much more difficult than oh could, do you think you could stay up an hour later you know that's just that's uh, a very typical kind of issue um, but with jet lag you know of course obviously it can cause sleepiness you can feel like you have insomnia depending on which direction you're going uh, it can cause a lot of uh, fatigue malaise that sort of thing also interestingly it tends to affect the GI system a lot um, it's kind of interesting how the GI system responds to travel, uh, but um, it can cause GI upset, and that doesn't have to be instantaneous. Usually, it's after a couple days that most individuals notice that when it happens. The older we are, the more susceptible we are to those jet lag effects. Um, and like I say, usually you have to cross at least two time zones in one day, so it's a little easier on a uh, road trip you know if you cross over and spend the night in central time zone for a day or two and then go to the west coast or the mountain time zone and then the west coast and you're a day or two in each one that's much much easier to adapt to um, uh, and, and of course that's easier than going from the west coast over to the the east coast uh, frequent travel can actually uh, significantly impact and change um, menstrual symptoms uh, for females so it's kind of interesting the different things that it can impact but um, usually like I say it's just kind of one of those things you have to adapt to uh, if you're particularly bothered by that you can do this is one case where chronotherapy can work um, uh, because it's just temporary you know you can start to either advance or delay in a, uh, uh, the week in advance if your schedule allows you know a lot of us just you know you're working or your kids have school that sort of thing so it's kind of difficult to start advancing or delaying to get into a different time zone sleep schedule uh, for that week or so before unless you just have a free schedule um, uh, but if somebody is in definitely impacted by this hypnotics um, melatonin uh, light therapy you know all that can um, uh, improve things uh, if you're significantly affected um, for in particular for eastward travel I just point this out because usually that's the most difficult evening melatonin afternoon light exposure uh, those are all uh, effective tactics that you can use to help uh, positively impact that okay circadian rhythm sleep disorders uh, due to other medical conditions so uh, you definitely see in individuals with dementia a lot of different changes uh, so uh, sundowning is a common phenomenon where they get less oriented at night more confused they're just their baseline cognitive deficits are more pronounced um, and a uh, very common issue that needs to be addressed uh, these individuals as I mentioned earlier can be advanced enough that they have that sort of irregular complete loss of their circadian rhythm uh, Parkinson's disease uh, can have significant impact on individual circadian rhythms uh, they have a lot of individuals with insomnia or hypersomnia uh, just depends on uh, what medications they're on and things like that but definitely you can uh, see a lot of sleep impact from Parkinson's uh, blindness as we mentioned earlier and then also liver disease or um, sometimes when the liver dysfunction is enough that it can cause a confusional state uh, that can really impact someone's uh, sleep phases and lead them to a very delayed sleep phase type pattern okay all right so I promised we'd talk about um, actigraphy for a minute and this is very interesting and uh, if you don't have this as part of your practice uh, it's uh, it's something that I would submit that's very helpful so it's nice to have uh, and you can always look at that and it can tell you a lot about somebody's sleep but it's basically um, these wrist watches okay if it's just an actigraphy uh, or actigraph unit 
Um, but a lot of this is incorporated into home sleep tests now uh, as a component to tell whether or not someone's awake or asleep. Um, so, uh, and that, that's why um, things like Fitbits and such can tell you, you know, you had such and such amount of sleep, you know, and, and this sort of thing. It extrapolates that uh, information from the movements, those actions, to tell uh, whether or not someone's likely awake or asleep because, and you may say, well, wait, I'm a fitful sleeper. Even if you are, uh, that movement is less than during uh, wakefulness. So you can really kind of clearly see patterns with most individual, even though there's some movements in there. And uh, usually people wear that for about a week or two weeks to give you these patterns. So just one night, it's not particularly helpful. Uh, just an isolated night can be misleading. Um, and then you can score that for interpretation and uh, really arrive at a diagnosis from that. Okay, so I hope everyone was paying attention. Here's where your little self quiz comes in. We're gonna look at some actigraphy examples, okay? So this is a uh, tracing from where someone's worn it for a week. And whenever you move, like we are even sitting there, you're still moving, okay? You may sit your uh, hands down for a few minutes, but then you, you, know, you do this, or you get a drink, or you ride, or things like that. So that's why you see these little black marks for movements, okay? So that's movements. And you can see there's sometimes where you move more, sometimes where you move less. And then during sleep, you see much fewer of those little black marks, okay? So, and just to orient you, this is around midnight here. So, for this individual, their typical bedtime, you know, ranges anywhere from around 2 a.m. to as late as about 6 a.m., something like that. And then their typical rise time is anywhere from noon to about maybe around 2 p.m., um, so, what would this example of? Is that? <laughs> Could be, uh, but a more classic. What would it, What would you think? Yeah, it's a delayed sleep phase pattern. Exactly. So, you know, they're going to... Oh, whoops. Wrong button. Oh, don't look. <laughs> You'll see all the answers. Okay, there we go. So... Um, you can see, again, another thing that you can see with delayed sleep phase, very variable bedtime. So, uh, and then they're, and then oftentimes, you know, they're, they're a little bit variable, but it's clear that their more typical wake time is in that, you know, that window right after noon or so. Right, here's our second example. What overall pattern do you notice with this? And this is, uh, just to orient you a little bit, this is um, two days worth. So this is one day and then the next, and it's over a longer period of time, uh, several uh, weeks there. Um, so what do you see? This is where, yes, non-24, exactly. You see this progressive delay in terms of wake time and bedtime. So most likely, this is uh, an individual who is blind, who doesn't have those kind of adequate cues. So you can see they've got a typical normal duration of sleep. Uh, and then their wake you see this progressive delay of when they're typically going to sleep each day. So that's why I see, you, uh, why I say you see that, it's almost like a staircase kind of pattern where every night gets a little bit later. And then if you followed this over time, what would happen? They'd get back. Yeah, exactly. All right. Example number three. So, typical bedtime, 
again, this is midnight. Yeah, around 6, sometimes as late as, you know, 7.30 or so. And you can have some outliers. That's not a, you're, What you're looking for is general trends, okay? And then uh, rise time, it's usually around 4 a.m. or so right there, right? So what would this pattern be? It's advanced, okay? They're going to bed early, waking up early. All right. What about the individual? What the heck is this? That's exactly right. That is a shift worker. So you've got two patterns here, right? Okay. You've got this pattern one where they're going to bed around here, around, you know, 1030. And, and so you can see, you know, here's a pattern. Here's another part of that pattern. Got some transitional kind of days in there. Going to bed about 10.30 to midnight. You know, it's fairly variable. Then they wake up around 7 a.m. Okay. Uh, and then, oh gosh, look at this. All of a sudden, here's this streak of solid days where they're going to bed around 8 a.m. And then they wake up. Uh, it's fairly variable, anywhere from noon to about 4 p.m. And, and that's also illustrative of the challenges that this introduces with the, the shift work. So, so, yeah, exactly. This is a shift work sleep disorder. Yeah. Well, you're fighting your own physiology. You know, that's what it is. Uh, it's because your brain is telling you um, that when you should be awake and when you should be asleep. So it can be a real challenge. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And doing those shifts, you know, trying to switch from one pattern to the next is so tough you know it's just it's a it's a huge challenge so anything you can do to minimize that you know the better um, the, I'm sorry did you have a yep all challenges and they compound one another don't they for sure yeah all right, and this is our last example. All right, so what's the pattern you see here? I heard somebody say there's not one. That is irregular sleep-wake type. So there's no identifiable pattern there, okay? So that's why, you know, these individuals, they nap frequently. Uh, their sleep is very highly fragmented. It's spread out throughout the day. Wake is spread out throughout the day. So they're just all over the place. Okay. Um, and this is someone I did actigraphy on. It was, uh, it was a really sad case. It was an individual who had a midline brain tumor and they attempted to resect it. But unfortunately, where it was, it impacted the hypothalamic area. So uh, it just kind of demolished this individual's circadian rhythm. Um, the surgery, it was necessary, you know, the surgery had to be done, but um, that's what it, uh, the net result of that, the impact of that. All right, and I think we are uh, close to out of time. So does anyone have any particular questions and I'll be around some uh, afterward as well uh, so feel free to swing by and ask me a question yes sir sure uh, a lot of that you're looking at oh yes absolutely sorry the, the question is how do you really differentiate between delayed sleep phase 
and uh, insomnia. And <clears throat> because obviously that's one of the ways it can present is as insomnia. Um, you're really looking a lot at that end point of the sleep period, okay? So uh, uh, with delayed sleep phase, um, you know, they tend to be sleepy and stay sleepy on into the day. And, and what you really have to ask is, what is your preferred pattern? What do you do when you're free to sleep as you would normally sleep? And a lot of individuals with delayed sleep phase, sleep phase will say, oh, if I'm on vacation, I'm fine. You know, or if it's a child, if they're on summer break, no, oh, I'm good. You know, <laughs> go to bed at three, wake up at noon, and I feel fine all day, sleep normally. Doesn't take me long to fall asleep. Versus insomnia, it can be, you know, oh, I have trouble falling asleep. I have trouble maintaining sleep. Uh, and usually those individuals don't sleep a lot during the day. I mean, there can other, be other confounding factors, like someone who just stays in bed far too much, like throughout the day, and uh, those kind of sleep hygiene kind of issues. So it can be complicated. But mainly through that history, you know, asking, okay, well, what is this like for you, this when you wake up, those kind of things. Plus, individuals with insomnia usually just have a more hyper alert baseline. So usually individuals with, hyper, with uh, insomnia don't complain of daytime sleepiness. Even though they're not sleeping well at night, if you say, are you sleepy during the day, they usually say, no, you know, I mean, I may take an occasional nap. But usually those individuals have a, just a higher level of uh, alertness that also, you know, obviously contributes to the insomnia. So you kind of look at uh, those uh, historical features. Yes, absolutely. It can be. Uh, the question is, uh, with individuals with Parkinson's disease who have hallucinations, uh, can that be attributed to microsleeps? Potentially, yes. Uh, that's a complicated answer because there are many things that go into that. Uh, individuals with Parkinson's disease are typically on dopaminergic medications, and dopaminergic medications in and of themselves commonly can lead to those kind of hallucinations, nocturnal hallucinations. But with uh, Parkinson's disease, you see much more REM sleep behavior disorder. And uh, they can go into stage REM sleep very rapidly upon going to sleep. Uh, and that doesn't have to be just nighttime sleep. They can you know, doze off in their recliner. And then the next thing you know, they're reaching for something. Or I've seen them even you know, kind of like think they're eating in their sleep. So <clears throat> those kind of situations, and a lot of times with Parkinson's, when they wake up from those, you'll have a little bit of intrusion of that dream content into wakefulness. So they can say, you know, did you see that? I just saw somebody you know, in the hallway. And usually it's like a fleeting kind of, they see a, a quick movement or a, you know, that sort of thing, like, what was that? You know, that, that kind of thing. So a lot of things can go into those. But yes, can that be part of it? Absolutely. All right. I think we're out of time, aren't we? Or is that right? Oh, we've got a couple minutes if there are any other questions or or if not. Yes, sir. Oh, that's right. Yes, absolutely. Yes, so very curious to see how that turns out. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, those transit. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you? My take on that. The, the question is um, with the recent debates, uh, political debates, and society debates about uh, um, daylight savings time and whether or not we should stay on one uh, schedule and not switch twice a year. Um, and. Uh, in general, yes, it's best if we're on one schedule and stay on that. Um, I do think there are definitely advantages to uh, staying on that same schedule. 
Um, the uh, uh, official position of the Sleep Society was to maintain, uh, to recommend maintaining one uh, schedule throughout the year, um, uh, even though they advocated for the traditional time schedule, not the daylight savings time uh, schedule. Um, I would like to see it uh, where we stay on one schedule because, you know, it it, it negatively impacts people. Uh, really kind of unnecessarily, I think. And, um, you know, I, I, I think having more light, especially in the evening hours, is more helpful for individuals because it can contribute to a lot of seasonal affective disorder, in my opinion, where, you know, people who work a traditional schedule and they get up in the morning and they go to work in the dark, they stay inside, they work all day, and then by 5 or 5.30 when it's time to get off and go home, it's already dark again. So that can contribute, uh, I think, to a lot of that seasonal affective disorder where people feel kind of depressed. And um, So yes, I would, like, I would vote for staying on, uh, on, on one schedule throughout the year. Right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I, I don't personally. I don't think that's the best option to stay on the standard time. I would favor staying on the delay uh, on on the not on the delay on the daylight savings time schedule. So yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.